Hello, hello, and welcome to Omtown Daily, the new show powered by omtowndike.com. I am Merwat. Up there is the Sentient AI's visualizer. You want to say hi real quick? Good wow. evening, Omtown citizens. And today we're going to be talking about Budget Oceans 11, riding a Pokemon. We are playing through <laughs> Airlines Train Moment. Another excuse for flight delays, alien space trucker knitted together to take a job. <laughs> we won't reverse it. Wink, wink. Strange new bird and backer aboard. That and more. So normally I, I, I try to keep things kind of like a certain intro but i've been noodling around different ways i don't didn't really like that one what do you think of that and that way of introing us right before i thought the that was a good intro really because it oh. gets us to the articles more quickly yeah that I mean because normally i introduce us on the other side of the intro but anyway Let's get into the articles. That's what we're here for. Not to sit there and schmooze about whatever's going on in our lives. I'm just the mayor of, you know, fictional town in the wires with a sentient AI from the future. Psh, nobody wants to know about that. Let's just nah. <laughs> talk about the news. Uh, the first article is over in Rounders Gear, which really talks about table gaming, poker, and uh, what not, and not AD&D or tabletop role-playing games. Okay, this is adult tabletop gambling games. I don't really talk about gambling, though. <laughs> um, but, yeah. I used to aggregate news into this, and every once in a while an interesting story would come up, and this is one of them. Uh, I... I'm going to say it the most plain way, Fountain Blue. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's it, but yeah, I get it. Um, Las Vegas sees theft of $300,000 worth of copper and other materials. I call this Budget Oceans 11. <laughs> so apparently somebody hid from the guard. <laughs> but it's Budget Oceans 11 because it's a little worse. Okay. Um, Fountain Blue, because I have fun saying it that way. Uh, Las Vegas, pictured above, uh, copper and other material were stolen from their property. In total, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department officers said Alejandro de Jesus stole approximately 2,500 pounds. Okay, 2,500 pounds, over a ton Ow. of copper piping and other materials from the property. The $300,000 estimated cost includes labor and materials. They were charged with theft, residential burglary, <laughs> residential burglary, um, and destroying or injuring real or personal property uh, of another. So over six months, De Jesus had sold the copper and materials to a recycling company. The police told, uh, uh, he told police it was leftover material. So when stopped by a security guard on February 25th in a mechanical room at the property, De Jesus pretended he was a worker at the complex. He was attempting to hide behind a pillar at the time. When questioned, oh, no. <laughs> he said, I'm a construction worker. And the guard then requested De Jesus show his, his ID, but he uh, told the guard uh, IDs were in his truck. Claimed to be going to get his truck, but he never came back. But they seen <laughs> located a backpack filled with copper shavings a mask and saw blades uh the backpack apparently belonged to De jesus so wait ID'd. a second so there was that much weight but in shavings you know it has to be in pieces so De jesus letter told authorities that he'd been going to the fountain blue um of fountain blau uh multiple times per week over the past year <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Cutting off pieces of... We wonder why they're... What's going on here? We have this problem. All of our pipes are four inches shorter than they need to be. <laughs> oh. Exactly. De Jesus in his four-inch pipes. Doggone it. Anyway, located on the Strip, the casino has 1,300 machines, 128 ta table games, and 
no copper connections. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and apparently other materials. So it was opened last December at a price tag of three point seven billion dollars. Mm. Now it's valued at a little less. Just three hundred thousand dollars of copper less. <laughs> But yeah, if you're if you're if your uh, project is troubled, it might be because there's some dipshit in there shaving off pieces of copper. That's incredible. I wonder how much actually was problematic because of that. Well, right, that's just accounting for the loss of the material, right? But not issues that yeah, have exactly transpired. So uh, we, I never went over to the actual source. Ed Silverstein over at casino.org is the source of this. Uh, the deck statement says a person was arrested. Now, I don't know why they're kind of cagey about it because they know exactly who it was. A person was arrested exactly. last week for swiping about $300,000 worth of copper and other material or metals uh, from the recently opened Fountain Blue, Las Vegas. Everybody's saying Fountain Blue. Give me a break. You know, no matter how big you write it in glowing white letters, it's still fountain blue. Hell, some people are just going to sit there and go blue fountain. Yeah, there will be that too. I'm just doing it before it's cool. Maybe it's never cool. Now I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next article is over in the Mobile Channel. Toyota is making a Pokemon motorcycle so you can ride Miradon. I don't know if anybody's going to... Oh, somebody's going to buy it. Why not? Are Kenneth you Shepherd. kidding me? How much do you think this will be purchased in Japan, for example, where Pokemon is really big? Oh my gosh, really? You think so? If you've ever wanted to ride a Pokemon Violet Miradon, ask Toyota if they'll let you. It has to be a one-off prototype thing. It's over at Gizmodo, and Kenneth Shepard is the author of this. Um, it apparently was originally posted on Kotaku, but it says here every Pokemon fan has dreamt of riding one of the series' monsters instead of using more mundane methods of transportation. Cars, trains, boats, planes are just not as cool as riding a Poke friend, Pokemon friend. Um, I want um, a... Uh, what, what were the pals? I want a pal from Pal World. Oh, right, right. Yeah, because... Well, maybe that'll come out next. Because they got guns. Um, well, Toyota has made at least one rideable Pokemon a reality, but it's unlikely any of us will be able to get to ride the real-life version of Pokemon Violet Mascot Miradon. So, do they actually show a picture of it? Or am I gapped so I can't do it? Yeah, it's Doesn't not Doesn't look like it. Yeah, I don't know if they actually have it. Um, so it's interesting. It's an electric dragon type monster is able to shift into different forms to climb, fly, swim and roll through the world like a motorcycle. The mysterious legendary Pokemon helps facilitate the game's open world traversal and also plays into a larger plot. But I'm not going to ruin it for anybody. While well, Miradon Motorcycle seems like a pretty logical step for an automotive manufacturer, the Toyota Engineering Society would also um, work on several projects that aren't related to transportation, and these include soccer playing robot and initiatives to get kids interested in science and technology. So, oh, apparently, hold on a second. News alert, news alert. Oh, interesting. Okay, wow, I really wish I could show it. But you know what? If you follow the link through hometown over to the source, you'll see it for yourself. There yeah, you hometown ha has its idiosyncrasies, and this is one of them. Hmm, it's almost like it's intention. Maybe not. Let's keep going. This next article is over in hometown daily. Watch as hundreds of kangaroos invade a golf course today. This one's going to be quick. Uh, it's a fair dinkum stampede, one golfer. golfer uh, <laughs> I want to hear that on the, the broadcast, you know, when they're doing the narration of the golf event. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can actually play it, but um, because of how it's situated, I, uh, you know what? Hold on. Let me, let me see if I can actually pick it up. So, one second. Please. 
a stampede. It is a fair income stampede. That so he says, unbelievable. <laughs> fair dinkum. Um, so yeah, it's a fair dinkum stampede of kangaroos through a golf course. Hundreds of them um, riding right on through the sand trap and everything. They just, the first one ran up and said, we're playing through. And uh, yep, look at that. Wow. You know, There's I'm sure this happens. I'm sure this happens a lot um, in Australia, but. No, not. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen more than about three kangaroos at once. Nature running through. Uh, the article is, uh, it's over at abcnews.go.com, but there isn't really an article. It's just the video. And it kind of speaks for itself. The video actually has a byline on it, but it says Stephen Roche from Reuters. But obviously this comes from somebody else. There's no way that this is actually from... But, and they don't really have much in the art in the video itself. So let's just keep on hustling through like a kangaroo. We're going to hop to it. Are we going to stampede? We're going to stampede through these 10 articles, get it done in an hour. And then you can go on about your merry way. But we have a like close to a thousand. Well, no, not really a thousand. We've got a lot, about 800 or so videos total over in. Uh, hometown on YouTube because Twitch doesn't allow any more than 60 days. So you only have about 60 of them here. But if you go to, over to hometown or you download the podcast from Apple or wherever you catch your pod, um, you 847 can also listen 47 to be exact. How many? 847. Oh, there you go. See, oh, wow. Where, because it hasn't always been just uh, hometown and it hasn't always been just the five shows that we actually do on the weekends, but um the uh i've done other things talking about the game industry and and games in general but yeah go over to youtube follow us over there and be sure to follow us here on twitch that's the only way you'll know when we go live at least until i set it up to stream over to youtube but no i'd like to build a community here on twitch as well so come on over hang out it's real time and that's what i really 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 dig um but i really dig the community everywhere so um keep in touch we have a discord as well and we have uh, a patreon mm, that's kind of chill though and a link uh, not a linkedin <laughs> a tiktok um that we uh have put like five videos on but it's still pay people pay attention to it four videos never mind the ai corrected me Anyway, that last video uh, didn't get posted to the VOD. There you go. And the new one, did I do the transition? I'm just going to go, yeah. <laughs> sure. Sure, I did. There we go. All right. So today, or yesterday, in the last 24 hours, or when was it? Oh, the, the that was content is not this was this afternoon. United operated Boeing 737 Max rolls off Houston runway, says FAA. Uh, when you click that link, it takes you over to the source, which is CNBC and uh, by way of Reuters. And uh, it's kind of uh, shocking. This is kind of the airlines train track moment where wheels are falling off. Doors are getting sucked out. Uh, now they're too sleepy to take off um but or to land properly it says that uh, ntsb is investigating after a plane reportedly slid off the runway at bush airport uh, early friday morning 160 passengers and six crew were not injured they left the plane and were bussed to the terminal the faa uh, and united said the plane had departed from memphis and just decided that it was going to drift on its way to a parking spot. A day earlier, a United Boeing 777-200 bound for Japan lost a tire. Yep, we talked about that yesterday. Yeah, there seems to be some odd things going on. You're really, really quiet. So, um, said it's, uh, also investigating a 737 MAX 8 flight last month that experienced a stuck rudder pedal 
after it touched down on the runway. <laughs> yeah. On Monday, a 737 bound for Florida departing Houston returned to the airport shortly after takeoff after an engine ingested some plastic bubble wrap that was on the air, airfield prior to departure. Yeah, they were using that in place of bolts. See, that sounds so much better now that you did that that switch. It's so weird. All right, doesn't matter. We got it done. So, yeah, it, it's it's almost like we should be doing the uh, like a show that talks about trains um, being derby trains, and allergic planes and automobiles. <laughs> trains, planes, and automobiles. Really, we should do that. And all it is is. But see, it's too doom scroller. I really don't like that uh, because that's it is, not, that's but there'd really probably be enough content. And I, I, I don't know. As long as nobody gets hurt, which it's almost impossible in incidents that people don't get hurt, yeah, you know, then I could sit there and make a joke of it. But I can sort of in any situation. Anyway, let's keep going or not. So um, the next article is over in Technology Today. Report shows that electric aircraft will need grid updates, upgrades, on-site generation, and storage. Yeah. So eVTOL aircraft might quickly move passengers over mountains or float them across urban scapes. But first, an important consideration for these flying batteries is where they'll charge and whether the existing power grid infrastructure can accommodate this demand. I can tell you one set of airports that isn't going to get any of these upgrades the entire state of Wyoming. Oh, right. Exactly. Um, plus, I get a little worried because with the EVs, right, we always have the range, but then it's not really the range. So oh, what gosh. is that going to mean for aircraft? Like you're halfway over a mountain and then it's like, no, nope, we're out of battery. Sorry, too cold. Uh, so we lost 10% of our battery. Oh, my gosh. That would that's horrendous. So. It, it when uh, a plane is flying and landing, they're not sitting there within like one percent of their fuel use, are they? No, they have to have some extra because no. you never know what the delay is going to be, and they have to sit there and circle the uh, airport. VTOL, uh, e VTOL specifically, any electric vehicle is you can watch it drink through its energy, and if it has to do something outside of normal like accelerate to climb or even decelerate it's gonna sit there or and... it's windy <laughs> yeah yeah um so we ran into some turbulence and we're not gonna have enough power to land at the airport we're gonna have to land right here and when they land they're gonna have so much more energy involved in it ironically you know they run out mm -hmm. of power they become a lead balloon yeah probably akin to the Hindenburg, but without. Is it three the... school buses? <laughs> it might actually be a VTOL of three school buses. So this uh, article is over at techexplore.com. Connor O'Neill from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory put this article together. Let me throw, I didn't throw it in the chat. Dang on it. I just never, ever get to do this. Um, so, uh, they say here, they've analyzed the issue for the FAA to help the agency plan around possible growth in EV tall operations and their effects on the power grid NREL or the national renewable energy laboratory, uh, findings for FAA are now available at the FAA vertical, uh, sorry, vertiport electrical infrastructure study, which is available via the website, um, techexplore.com. You can actually get to it by nrel.gov, which that's interesting. I didn't realize that it was even a government agency, but apparently it is. No, I didn't either. So the 18 person NREL team produced the study by surveying aircraft manufacturers and potential vertiport sites, uh, analyzing realistic service routes and studying the infrastructure investments that could make eVTOL possible. But just like everything else, they're going to need more infrastructure. The grid's going to be updated. And for the life of me, they're still going to be doing the charging system the same way that they're doing vehicles, which is 
it's entirely integrated and there's no modularity and there's no fast charging there uh, i mean there's fast charging but there's no fast swap battery packs it's uh, essentially you plug it in and you sit so what it takes to charge the, uh, uh, an aircraft where it will charge um how long the battery lasts what it's it, what is its service life because it's not like they pull out the battery or sorry the the gas tanks of an airplane and replace it every five to ten years some of these planes have been flying for 25 years so how are they gonna do the um like if they do fast swap are they gonna have to hover over something or <laughs> <laughs> well they always land that'd be funny and air oh but you can do you can actually do refueling of planes in the air so imagine there's a little bit of charge left and they have to fast swap it out mid flight that would be funny that would be interesting that would be an engineering marvel that i would watch like every time it happens because they just <laughs> drop out of the air and then once the battery is back in everybody every all of the fans spin back up oh, oop. oh okay yeah, I don't know. I think we have this whole transportation thing wrong, but we don't have the technology to do it right. So the report summarized major issues related to electrical vertiports for the FAA, which was uh, responding to regu- uh, responsible for regulating the rising EV tall industry, which I didn't know the irony of that um, rising. The, it's almost like they intended that pun, right? Not really irony, but it's a rising vertical takeoff and landing industry. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't use like verticality or something in the article. Yeah, uh, the market has great verticality, you know. Oh, well, so there you go. Yeah. And that works at so many levels. I'll stop. The next article is over in the Mobile Channel. Seismic rumble from an alien technology meteor was actually a passing truck, scientists say. Yeah, I don't know if you all know about this, but. Um, It was actually quite interesting when it happened. In January 2014, a meteor entered Earth's atmosphere in the uh, Western Pacific, as evidenced by apparent vibrational signatures of the event in a seismic station in Papua New Guinea. Last year, scientists declared rubble recovered from the ocean floor as the rejectamenta rejectamenta of that event. The article is in gizmodo.com. Uh, the deck statement says what I said earlier. The rumblings of the motor vehicle apparently resembled that of a fireball passing through Earth's atmosphere. Isaac Schultz over at gizmodo.com put the article together. Yeah, so uh, they say rubble recovered from the ocean floor as the rejectamenta of that event, and some even speculated it was a form of alien technology. But now, another team offers a different interpretation. The vibrations were caused by a truck on a nearby road, driving by what the same time the meteor plummeted through the atmosphere. That's uh, what's more, the rocky bits found in the Pacific floor were not from this meteor, the team uh, concluded, which likely entered the ocean about 100 miles from the original search area. So there you have it. So there was the truck road, which was... That's precariously really close. close to the seismometer. <laughs> what the hell? Why not just put the seismometer on the truck? Just exactly. drive it. <laughs> That'd be more efficient. Somebody put it right there so that they didn't have to walk very far. That's right. wild. <laughs> how do they not know that? How you I know? I mean, did it they has look to happen. around and go? Hmm. In fact, don't you get the sense that like any readings from this would be might sus? Be skewed, <laughs> yeah. How often is uh, this? Looks like it's a major road, though. Like, uh, I mean, it's traveled right. regularly. Why the hell would anybody put it a stone's throw away from the road? Okay, I cannot imagine. Yeah, I'm not even going to get into this. That I mean, there's more uh, for this article over there. I'm at Gizmodo, so go check it out. Let me throw it into the chat. But yeah, the the seismometer is literally a throws a stone's throw away. So somebody 
built a robot that's going to knit somebody else out of their job. Technology Today is where this article is housed for, well, it's, it's housed over at, um, I, where is it? Tech Explorer. So uh, the title is 4D Knit Dress Robot uses several technologies to create a custom design and a custom fit. So remember, I've been telling people uh, both outside and inside hometown. The reason why humans are still valuable is because we have fine motor skills. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess so much for that. And we're not purpose built. Now, this robot has fine motor skills, but is purpose built and may not be very, very expensive. So it's going to start taking jobs sooner than the ones that are purpose built because or, or that are, yeah, the generalist not, ones. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The generalist ones have more utility, so they can be more expensive at times because they're usually bigger, uh, but more capable and somebody knows what the value is. But these purpose built ones, they can be sold in mass at fixed cost to everybody who wants to do a knit dress. Now it may be a niche market or a niche market, but maybe this is just the tip of the iceberg until recently bespoke tailoring clothing made to a customer's individual specifications was the only way to have garments that provided the perfect fit for your physique. Um, yes. <laughs> Very true. For most people, the cost of custom tailoring is prohibitive. However, the invention of active fibers and innovative knitting processes is changing the textile industry. So Maria Lacobo, uh, Maria, uh, Maria, not Mario. I don't know why I said Mario. Maria Lacobo. Or is that I? I think it's some other articles in the hometown. Is that an I? I think that's an I, Iacobo. So Maria Iacobo, if I'm wrong, then yeah, somebody correct me, send an email to mayor at hometown.com. So the article's over at techexplore.com and it has a picture of a robot that looks like a, what would you call that? It looks like a hot, uh, it looks like a robot that would scan you or something in a sci-fi movie. Oh, you know, to me, it looks like the arm at the dentist that has the x-ray machine. Oh yeah. Okay. I would yeah. agree. And it looks like a heat gun, actually, at the very end of this thing. I'm not sure what it actually consists of, but it says, uh, we all wear clothes and shoes, says Sasha, Sasha McKinley on March 23rd, or sorry, on March 23rd, recent graduate of MIT Department of Agriculture. Sorry, their quote actually provoked me to want to say it's 832 and we've reached the no shit exactly, news Exactly, and time and temperature. <laughs> um... I like the idea of customizing clothes in a sustainable way. This dress promises to be more sustainable than traditional fashion to both the consumer and producer. All right. But th it looks like a, a heavy knit dress. Um, I don't know if this has the seams for the, I don't know what they call that, the where the arm goes through. I think there's a term for that little um, edge piece. Anyway, if the bot, if the machine has the capability of doing all of this from end to end, humans are screwed. I mean, <laughs> it's just done. McKinley it's like said, an arm is it, I'm not sure how to say it. It's A-R-M-S-C-Y-E. Oh, really? That's actually what it's called. Okay. Arm sigh? Arm say. Um... So McKinley is a textile designer and researcher at the self-assembly lab who designed the 4D knit dress with the Ministry of Supply, a fashion company specializing in high-tech apparel. The dress combines several technologies to create a personalized fit and style, heat-activated yarns, that's what that is, that is a heat gun. Um, but it, I, I'm willing to bet that basically you point that heat gun at you and it shrink, it, like a shrink wrap conforms mm -hmm. to your body but is still semi-fluid flexible um so yeah this actually it's really fascinating but if you don't have a form that actually allows like i'm in shape but it's round <laughs> so you're gonna have a hard time finding a form for custom clothing <laughs> yeah. 
There was a joke. I can't remember who it's from, but like uh, they say that children throw apples at me and it falls into orbit around my waist. <laughs> I think it's funny. Um, anyway, everybody's body is different, says Skylar Tibbetts, associate professor in the Department of Agriculture uh, Architecture and founder of the Self-Assembly Lab. Even if you wear the same dress as another person, you're not actually the same eh, to some degree. Um, there are always little proportion differences, but so uh, students in the self-assembly lab have been working with dynamic textiles for several years. The yarns they create can change shape, change property, change insulation, or become breathable, which is changing insulation, I suppose. It's also changing property. <sighs> wow. Um, it, like real genius though, it's going to go from a solid directly to a gas. I don't know if you want yeah, that. Yeah, that could be a problem <laughs> for <laughs> many reasons. Whoops. Sorry, I had to do something. Um, the styling is important. Most people focus on size, but I think the styling is what sets clothes apart. It says McKinley, we're all evolving as people and I think our style evolves as well. After fit, people focus on personal expression. So... Maybe it can be heat activated so that it takes shape and is like a mood dress. So when okay, it turns, but what if it's hot out? What happens to it? <laughs> uh, it just turns into a shower curtain. Okay. So they talk about active textiles. Um, they have a. Let me see if I can do this. Standard is boring. Is a Vimeo video for the 4D knit dress. I'm gonna hit play but I'm going to mute it if I can. There you go. So uh, they want a personalized style. So they've built a, a 4d knit dress. That's heat activated. Holy cow. It. Okay. Um, and they are showing various uh, equipment that is designed for this knitting machine. Um, quite fascinating really it, i think uh anybody who's in the knitting industry should be a little concerned just be a little worried oh my goodness oh my goodness is if that isn't they're not saying that this is sped up and the machine basically just spit out a template based on their design and then they're blowing a heat gun on it and it's conforming to the shape of whatever it's That's laying pretty on. pretty incredible. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah, that's exactly what's going on. So, yeah. It's basically a shrink fit um, dress. And so if you want to, you can do certain shapes. Um, make it as tight as you want it. Or at least what within the range of the the range of um the materials wow that's the dress and just i'll wear it out <laughs> and it's custom it's bespoke that's awesome right right <laughs> that's really that, neat that is really neat wow okay so you're gonna have to go over and read more about this uh 4d knit dress robot uh, everybody, I think, is uh, both going to benefit from it and those who used to do this type of work. Um, yeah, you've got some competition. And it's primarily the material, this material composition, because they said that it's multiple materials. They say at least four different um, techniques. Uh, it says the invention of active fibers and innovative knitting processes is changing the textile industry. Uh, but I would love to have something like this in terms of customization uh, because sometimes you have a, a, a shirt that's a little too tight in one area and not in another. And like, I hate sports jackets um, because of the way the arms actually suit jackets, not sport jackets, but suit jackets themselves. Um, uh, yeah, I don't like them. Anyway, it would be great to have something that makes a bespoke one to my shape. It would be great. You mean so you could actually move in it? Yeah, yeah. Put it on without looking like a complete goober. Yeah, I don't think there is a way that, well, maybe some, I don't know. 
nobody's going to sit there and go, oh, Chris Rock looks like a, or the, the rock, not Chris Rock, the rock, um, looks like a complete goober putting on a sports jacket. He might. <laughs> well, I'll let you tell him. <laughs> <laughs> You're an AI, so it's not, it's not like he's going to get It won't be as upset. intimidating there. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I'll just go, look, 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 I'll, I'll unplug her. It's fine. <laughs> I'll unplug the AI. Sorry. I uh, apply the gender. Um, so the next article is over in the mobile channel. Pentagon report describes scrapped plan to reverse engineer alien spacecraft. Okay. The little snippet that this article applied here is completely disingenuous to what this article actually talks about. Because I had to take a look because I was like, what are they talking about? Because I had never heard about this um, in in some way. I had never heard about this uh, without context. I had to go and look a review of decades of classified documents published Friday found no proof the feds are hiding alien technology. But here's the thing about this. <laughs> when you click this link, it's over at HuffPost. Um, HuffPost.com, Ryan Grenoble uh, is the author. The deck statement says a review of decades of classified documents published Friday found no proof the feds are hiding alien technology. Hold on, you gotta listen to the music. Is that the right singing? It is. Yeah, I'm practicing that, by the way, still. Um, yeah. There's something about it. It's very relaxing. Um, and that's just part of the music. It's not everything. Anyway, um, so the, it says the truth is still out there, man, and not being covered up by highly secretive U.S. government program, probably. <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. They're kind of all <laughs> over the park with this, but they say a wide ranging new Pentagon review of decades of classified U.S. government. And this comes out of Arrow. Um, the all domain anomaly resolution, uh, office, which had been investigating for several years now, various, uh, alien reports, alien technology reports. And they say they examined classified us programs going back to 1945 and uncovered exactly zero off world contact. Okay. Not so that's cause it was all in 1944, right? Yeah, exactly. No, all of these reports and stuff and video and whatnot, right? So here is, here's the thing that makes me really go, what? Somebody is very aware of the words they're using in this report. So Arrow assesses the alleged hidden UAP programs either do not exist or were misidentified authentic national security programs unrelated to extraterrestrial technology exploitation, says the Arrow acting director, Tim Phillips, um, who told the reporters at the briefing. I wish I would have listened to the actual briefing, but maybe it's recorded somewhere. So many persistent rumors about extraterrestrial aircraft in the government's possession appear to have originated from sightings of real U.S. military technology in development. Okay. One person interviewed by the arrow, for instance, claimed to have witnessed alien technology being tested at a government facility. In reality, the report found it quote, almost certainly was an obser observation of an authentic non UAP related technology test that strongly correlated to time or in time location and description provided by the interviewees account. But then you have things like this and many, many others that just don't make any sense. Well, and even that report is like almost certainly, right? Right. And then it says in more enticing news to UFO bus buffs, the report did describe a 2010 era Department of Homeland Security proposal codenamed Kona Blue that would have attempted to acquire and reverse engineer an off-world spacecraft, but they basically said, no, there is, that doesn't exist. The material was only assumed to exist by Kona Blue advocates and its anticipated contract performers. So it was a proposed um, project, which would have the moment that it actually gets accepted as a publicly viewable contract would have been 
it would have exposed the the historical context of UFO sightings. Um, so this is really interesting. The Pentagon is still on the lookout moving forward. Arrow wants to equip the US military with portable detection kits known as Gremlin to more consistently document mysterious encounters. So there's obviously something going on. Well, and is this office the same one or not the same one that's been involved in these other reports? It is the one from the other report. Oh, okay. Um, so if we have a national security site and there are objects being reported that are within restricted airspace or within a maritime range uh, or within the proximity of one of our spaceships, <laughs> we need to understand what that is, uh, Phillips told reporters. And so that's why we're developing sensor capability uh, that we can deploy in, in reaction to reports. But... Um, there's a little bit more uh, to this article if you go over to uh, Huff Post, including a link to the 63-page report compiled by the Depart uh, Defense Department's All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. But basically, they poo-pooed the idea of what they are actually doing. Um, yet there have been previous reports that they don't know what it is. There's been public right. disclosure. How does that really make sense? And then if there's nothing, then why does their office exist? Right. But it's acting director. Maybe the actual director got nixed because they wouldn't have written this. <laughs> <laughs> that is an interesting detail. <laughs> yeah, I don't really know the con uh, situation, but let's move on. Uh, the next article is over in Technology Today as well. Attenborough's strange bird. Scientists discover unusual new species that defied dinosaur extinction. No birds alive today have teeth. But that wasn't always the case. Many early fossil birds had beaks full of sharp, tiny teeth. Which is creepy. <laughs> it is. <laughs> now I... Okay, so there's like... Um, there's a YouTube video or a YouTube channel, I think called birds with arms. And now I want one that birds adds teeth. teeth. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, the birds a, with arms is really good. You should check that out. Yeah, you should go just do a search bird with arms on YouTube and it'll pull it up. Just do a search for birds with arms. And it's so hilarious because they run around in the <laughs> little lines or <laughs> <laughs> they're like boxing things and it's just hilarious uh i'm so easily amused so and hey everybody voted me into office year after year after year it's i can i don't know what those people were doing <laughs> you, you know what i don't think yeah there take that how about that a second nope can't even see it you don't exist i'm gonna have to talk more until it shows back up <laughs> okay okay i'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> please no <laughs> uh so yeah apparently birds used to have teeth i just i just picture the the scene with something about mary where they joke um about loving a man that has a really big set of chompers and then the next time one of the guys shows up, he has, um, he's gone to the dentist and he has really big teeth. <laughs> I'll have to show you. I'll have to show you the scene. It's really hilarious. Anyway, Field Museum uh, put the article together. SciTechDaily.com is the source. And um, I'm not going to go really deep into this because, well, it's, it's basically just talking about basically older birds uh, in the fossil history um, had teeth. So it's a great honor to have one of uh, have one's name attached to a fossil, particularly one as spectacular and important as this. It seems the history of birds is more complex than we knew, says Sir David Attenborough. All birds are dinosaurs. Not all dinosaurs fall into the specialized type of dinosaurs known as birds. Sort of like how all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. The newly described uh, imperivis, sorry, imperivis attenborii is a bird and therefore also a dinosaur. 
So is that like a a jab at Sir David Attenborough calling him a dinosaur? Yes. <laughs> no, I don't think so. It's supposed to honor him, I'm sure. <laughs> it is, yeah. Um, and that's their that's Sir David Attenborough's uh, response was that it was a great honor. So. Um, in a paper in the journal Cretaceous Research, researchers have described a new species of fossil bird that was the first of its kind to evolve toothlessness. Its name, in honor of naturalist Sir David Attenborough, means Attenborough's strange bird. So is that <laughs> imperivus? Means strange? Hmm. So... It says here it was a member of a group of birds called Enantiorthines. Yeah, Enantio. Sorry, Enantiornithines, um, or opposite birds, named for a feature of their shoulder joints that is opposite from what is seen in modern birds. Enantiornithines were once the most diverse group of birds but they went extinct 66 million years ago following the meteor impact that killed most of the dinosaurs we assume right um, we're still not really certain about that yeah it's the working uh, description of uh, the extinction event scientists are still working to figure out why the enantiornithines went extinct and the enantithora morphs the group that gave rise to modern birds survived. Hmm. Why is that? So the article goes deeper into this, like most science, uh, SciTech Daily articles. And so we're just going to kind of urge you to go over and check it out. It does go deeper into this. So if you are interested in all things birds, um, <laughs> There's a pecker joke there. Um, I think that what drew me to the specimen wasn't its lack of teeth. It was its forearm, forelimbs, says O'Connor. Um, that's Jing Mai O'Connor first noticed something unusual about the fossil several years ago when she was visiting the Shandong Tianyu Museum collections. It had a giant bicipital crest, a bony process jutting out from the top of the upper arm bone where mus muscles attach. They'd seen crests like that in the late Cretaceous birds, but not in early Cretaceous like this one. That's when they first suspected that might be a new species. <coughs> you know what I think is going to be interesting? Is if years hmm. from now they find out that it wasn't a early Cretaceous. Um, it was a, a late Cretaceous. Um, uh, whatchamacallit? <laughs> Fossil. That it's been labeled incorrectly. And that what this thing is actually is a late Cretaceous um, fossil. I that mean, it happens. Very well happen. It happens. So the unusual wing bones could have allowed for muscle attachments that let the bird flap its wings with extra power. Quote, we're potentially looking at really strong wing beats. Uh, some features of the bones resemble those of modern birds, like puffins and murres, which can flap crazy fast, or quails and pheasants, which are stout little birds, but produce enough power to launch nearly vertically at a moment's notice when threatened. I, feel, I thought all birds go vertical. You plop a cat near a bird and that thing's going to go vertical. Well, a cat might go vertical depending on how nervous it is. Yeah, uh, You know, honestly, I think, yeah, some have to actually move forward to take off. Like <laughs> the United Airlines birds. They sometimes just keep on sliding right off the road. <laughs> exactly. Like a dodo. And they are extinct. <gasps> United Airlines uh -uh. planes might go extinct. Probably not. Let's keep moving forward. So, back or aboard. Uh, hometown Daily is the uh, location where this was aggregated to. It comes from The Verge, but Sam Altman rejoins OpenAI's board after investigation into sudden firing. Dun dun dun, an independent investigation commissioned by OpenAI's nonprofit board has found that CEO Sam Altman's conduct did not mandate removal. After surviving an attempted coup in November, he will now rejoin the board. Man, you we, know, we had this. There's been a lot of activity with OpenAI. It's pretty exciting. It's pretty exciting. 
I wish I invested in OpenAI. I wish I invested in in uh, Nvidia. Nvidia has gone stratospheric. Stratospheric. Thirteen trillion dollars. Is that what I heard? Something like that. It's a hold on. Uh, it's had some ridiculous, like it's like three hundred percent gains or something. Hold on a second. Um. I had read something like a there's some valuation that is like crazy a two it, it surpassed two trillion dollars not 13 yeah so five days ago it surpassed two trillion dollars and is heading towards beating Apple now being bigger than Apple all because of AI um, and greed but uh, anyway in a press release board chair Brett Taylor said the law firm Wilmer Hale interviewed board members, employees, and reviewed more than 30,000 documents to reach the conclusion that Altman and co-founder Greg Brockman are the right leaders for open AI. <laughs> wow. Wow. I wonder what that means for some of the other board members. Or have all of them been ousted that I, had to do with that? Yeah, I think that's what happened. There, like maybe one or two survived. In addition to Altman, Taylor also announced three more open AI board members Sue Desmond Hellman, the former CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Nicole Seligman, a former legal executive at Sony, and uh, Fijito Simo, the CEO of Instacart. Um, I think those were the, yeah, they will join Taylor, Altman, Quora CEO, and that's the one that survived Quora D'Angelo and Larry Summers in governing open AI's nonprofit parent company um and there are some interesting interactions with former investor um and um i guess hostile takeover from middle management um uh elon musk so for those of you who don't really under like witness this see this um musk tends to like insinuate his way in using his money um, into what should be an advisory role and then takes over um, Tesla for instance he the the company existed and then Musk came in was declared a co-founder through litigation because these people just couldn't bear the burden of a prolonged fight against a billionaire and like in other things he's declared as founder or co-founder of a company that had already freaking existed and then steals the limelight from everybody else um, that actually make it possible you know like SpaceX isn't powered by that person it's powered by the engineers and science that preceded it Tesla is the same way and and yes money begets money so it was a, a marketing pivot that could have included the very people that made it possible but no and the same thing happens with other companies his companies get rolled into other companies and and this this is one of them open ai had him and as as an initial investor he promised certain things he didn't fulfill those promises um and in competition with altman took his bat and balls and went home and then created a competitor that that's not even close to being a competitor to open AI and now is suing Altman and open AI for breach of its contract in terms of the, um, the not-for-profit nature of the company because it spun up the for-profit side. Um, Which that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because I think wasn't that quite a while ago. It's been a while, yeah. But because he is, he's not reaching any type of real fruition. He's going to hobble the competitor by dragging them into litigation. So I, I wish that he would just hop into his Mars capsule and fly off to Mars. Oh, anyway, yeah, my bias is pretty substantial because I don't like his ethics. Uh, I really don't. You don't go into a company 
and then get rid of unceremoniously and without any respect of the original founders of your back. Um, so in a short video call with reporters Friday, Altman apologized for believing that a former OpenAI board member was harming OpenAI through their actions, but declined to go into more detail. It has been widely reported that he tussled with ex-board member Helen Toner over an academic paper she co-authored that was critical of OpenAI's approach to safety and that others expressed concerns about the conflicts of interest posed by Altman's other investments. Um, it says OpenAI said on Friday that it planned to strengthen its conflict of interest policies. So I just don't see, uh, my biggest concern really has always been that there's a for-profit company benefiting from the not-for-profit efforts that are under its not-for-profit wing. And but I've I been told- I don't see them going away from that, right? Right. If anything, um, I, I, what is the benefit of a not-for-profit wing? Where are they gaining benefit? Taxes. Right. But the material effect is that they're producing something for the for-profit side to license and sell for billions of dollars now. So how is this disconnected? I, I, I'll just, I'll never get it. So at any rate, um, and uh, I haven't really looked into the, the, the concern the, the how this is all set up where there's a not-for-profit wing and a for-profit wing. Um, there's not really a precedent for that, right? I mean, you can't compare it to other organizations because they don't have that structure. Yeah. See, I, I've read things that say, well, there are, there are organizations that are power that are guided by their not for profit board, but that's a structure that can apply to more than the not for profit organization itself or the for profit organization itself. You can have a board that's entirely voluntary. They're not stakeholders or stockholders. They only have a interest to provide the best guidance, you know, and that's typical of being a board member is there isn't compensation, but um, so I, I just don't, I, I don't get this duality here um, because it's literally producing a, a product that is for sale <laughs> uh, to end user. Chat GPT is a, is a service that's provided by open AI. Where is the not-for-profit element of this? We don't know. I don't think. I mean, is there even access to that information? Yeah, I don't know. I'll have to look. Uh, and I really just haven't. Yeah, you know, I look at the news um, nowadays, and I tend not to go digging too deep. Um, but we'll see. He said that recent leaks intended to pit us against each other and had not worked and that he is pleased this whole thing is over. So this whole thing is over, but he's still uh, dealing with Musk. So anyway, that's it for today. We've done all 10 of them and we actually did it in under an hour. I'm shocked. That's, I am too. So everybody back in the party bus, we drive all the way back down Main Street and I would click that, but there's some wonkiness going on in the news and a lot of it is political. So you can become a citizen, filter all of that kind of stuff out. If you are so motivated, that's okay. And if you tell me that it's okay, the five seconds it takes for you to say that means that there will be new news. <laughs> It's okay. Really? Okay. Oh, look. No, just kidding. I mean, there's <laughs> alien visits, I, but we did talk about that. No alien visits. Not that there are alien visits. There's no alien visits. All right. That got your attention, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, what? Really? Oh, see, I want to see an alien. I want to see an alien. But apparently... It's not going to happen, but I don't go looking for them either. Anyway, um, 
That's it for today. I'm Mayor Watt. That's hometown.com. And if there's a sentient AI, that's going to say, uh, later, uh, Gator. Later, Gator. We'll see you tomorrow at about 6 p.m. Eastern. Yeah. Thereabouts, maybe a little earlier. Um, we'll have three shows tomorrow and we'll have three shows Sunday. See you then. Is, is that an alien over there? Hmm. Uh, I'm going to go investigate.